And morning everybody an absolute pleasure to be back um I've, I've, I've experimented slightly with the source sheet i've decided to give you only pictures uh this was uh in bushy yeah, I, was, I was giving them reams of torah on printed paper and somebody said i i, I like the pictures so he said you know fine so i'll i'll, I'll just i'll just do pictures we're experimenting, experimenting with just the pictures and um you'll see as the sheet comes around there is an interesting set of images on the front sheet just wonder if anybody knows what they are, what's going on. Any oh, guesses? Oh, wow. Very good. Oh, Very good. We have to get the pictures first, but we've had, yeah, fantastic. They're, 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 mutts, are, they're mutts are baking. But there's obviously something quite interesting here. What, 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 oh. I mean, if you turn over the page, you'll see that, well, I'll tell you straight off the bat. This is something that's referred to as the bird head. Haggadah. Now, this Haggadah is notable for a number of reasons. The, the most famous of which is that all the people, or almost, in this Haggadah are depicted as having bird heads. Now, this Haggadah, by the way, is extremely old. It's actually the oldest illustrated Ashkenazi Haggadah that we have, and it's from the year, I mean, it's from the 16th century. It's 50, uh, let me just try to find the exact year. Um, 1563 ish. Sorry, no, 14th century or not 15th, 14th century. 14th century is an extremely old Haggadah. And if you look over on the second page, you can see the words are essentially as we would have them in our Haggadah. They're, they're pretty much exactly the same. But there is a degree of mystery as why these Jewish people in this Haggadah are depicted as having bird heads. Now, there are a number of theories floating around. Everybody ha has it a guess as to why they have bird heads. So th there is a school of thought that these that this Haggadah was illustrated or at least printed by non-Jewish people, and there is either degree of ignorance or anti-Semitism that contributes to them having bird heads. However, that is not the widely accepted theory. The widely accepted theory is this was done on purpose by Jews. We're going to explore why this is. But first, we have to make sure that we have no idolaters in the room. Anybody here Anybody here have a secret stash of idols at home? Sure about that? Let's find out. Let's find out. I, this, this is quite a far-fetched series. Not far-fetched. Uh, I was dropping my daughter off at a friend's cousin's birthday party so my daughter Chava is going to her friend's cousin's birthday party now Chava's friend's cousin's neighbor is a very from family and they had two giant statues of lions outside their house I thought this is weird this this this, this doesn't look right so something's jangling in the back of my head the Jewish person to have two gracious statues sitting outside their front door I thought something's weird here I thought I'd have a snoop around and this conversation really starts with Gemara and Avodah Zara. The Gemara and Avodah Zara says that there's a, a posse in the Torah, Shemais Perek Chaf, Posse Chaf, that says, Loi sasun iti, you shall not make with me, that's Hashem speaking, saying gods of silver and all these other graven images. And it's interpreted to mean in the Gemara that you can't make, as the Gemara says, figures of Hashem's attendants who serve before him on high, for example, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the constellations. You can't have any of these images in your home. Now, the Gemara then says, there's also a concern of having a human figure as well. And the Gemara says, well, this seemingly would be an issue. However, we have a story of a shul that was destroyed in Eretz Yisrael. It was re-established in Bovel. And as a gesture of gratitude to the king at the time in Bovel, who had allowed them to set up the shul again, they, this, they don't do this in shul, but they set up a statue of the king in shul. They set up a statue of the king in Shul as a big thank you. Now, it seems that, although there may have been some alarm, Shmuel's father and Levi, two very reputable Jewish people, would nonetheless doven in this Shul. And they dovened in the Shul, and there was a statue of the king in the Shul. And the Gemara says, how can this be? How can it be an idol, a graven image in a Shul, and they're all dovening in there like it's no, no problem? So the Gemara suggests an answer, and it says a public institution is different. If it's in public, it's on display, we're not worried about people serving up. 
Then we come to a famous story of Rabbi Gamliel, who, as the Mishnah in Rosh Hashanah says, when witnesses would come and say, we have seen the new moon, he would display to them pictures of the sun, the moon, the stars. And he would say, did the moon look like this? Was the sun here? Was the stars there? And the Gemara goes crazy. How can it be? Fair enough. He's, 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 um, he, sorry, he's a private person. If it's in public, like the statue of the king, the shul, fine. A private person to have pictures of Mazoles and Tehovim, stars in his office, the rabbi nonetheless. How can this be? So the Gemara suggests three answers. Firstly, this is a quite an answer that cuts quite close to the bone. Rabbis are considered to be public prophets. You know, so he wasn't public in the typical sense, like the statue in the shul, but rabbis are public property. Everybody walks in and out. It's considered to be a public display of these things. And if it's in public, it's not considered to be a concern of voters. The second answer is that they were actually in pieces. There was no actual complete image that was there. And they were maybe like a puzzle. And it was a puzzle. They were all in pieces. And maybe you could sort of put them sort of close together, but maybe not touching. And there was that second answer. And the third answer is that when you're doing it to teach people, that's different. So the Gemara tells us, this Gemara of Odizar, there are three licenses to have statues or pictures of heavenly bodies and people. One, it can be in public and that would be okay. Two, it can be in pieces. That would also be okay. And three, it can be um, made to teach somebody and that would also be okay. The Ramban, however, well, there is a dispute now between the Ramban and the Rambam, that's Nachmanides and Maimonides, as to whether this applies to two-dimensional images as well. And this is the prevailing theory behind why these people in the bird's head Haggadah are drawn with bird's head. Because the Ramban says it is prohibited to draw even a two-dimensional image of a person. And it is thought that the authors of this Haggadah were stringent for the opinion of the Ramban and as a result refused to entertain the, or refused to have published pictures of even two-dimensional people as an expression of loisa sumiti. You cannot make pictures of people or heavenly bodies even in a two-dimensional form. So though there are people that say, oh, the bird's head Haggadah was maybe made by anti-Semites, or maybe it was made by ignorant people. The prevailing theory is that the reason why they avoided having people drawn in the Haggadah is because even two-dimensional people are a problem. Now, the question still remains, why do they choose bird heads? Okay, so you don't want to draw people because even two-dimensional people, according to certain authorities, are going to be prohibited. You can't even draw two-dimensional birds. Why do they choose eagle heads? So there are a number of suggestions. One is that it's eagles represent mobility, and it was a, a it was a sort of a symbol of Jewish people going about their Pesach preparations, not in a state of panic and not in a state of hysteria and stress, but rather in a dignified, graceful way, as an eagle would soar above the clouds. Another idea suggested is that in the 14th century, Jews in Germany, where this was printed, were under Roman protection. So as a gesture of thanks to the Romans, who were offering them protection at the time, they had this eagle, which was typically a Roman symbol. So it was actually a gesture of thanks to the Romans for keeping them safe. But this gives us a very, very interesting halachic context as to why this Haggadah is the way it is. If anybody wants to go see it, it is on permanent display in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. So if you'd like to go see it, you can pop into the Israel Museum in Jerusalem and you can go and see it. There is something very interesting at the bottom of the second page. You'll see on the left-hand side, there are a lot of Jews holding dough and or matzah. However, on the that's on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, there are two people on horses that don't have bird heads. In fact, in fact, they are probably the most human-looking people in the whole Haggadah. And these are actually, I, I, the theory is that these are actually supposed to be Egyptians. And the Egyptians are presented as not having mm. bird heads, which further leads to the principle that maybe this bird head is a specifically Jewish uh, praise, but they actually don't have any faces at all. And so they're a human depiction, but with no face at all. And the, the, the suggestion there is that they're trying to um, depict some sort of weakness to the Egyptians. They have no sort of um, a, no real power or no real impact. And the Jews <laughs> are the eagles flying untouched 
going about their daily business. So this is the, the bird Haggadah. But the question now, therefore, is what practically do we do about pictures and statues and maybe even other sorts of things that we have in our homes? If you turn over to the third page, you'll see, does anyone know who that person is on the top left-hand corner there? Do we know who that is? Give you a clue. Uh, he's from Amsterdam. Well, this was in Amsterdam. Sorry? No, I don't think so. No, but actually quite close. It's not Shabtai Tzvi, it's actually the Chacham Tzvi. It's the Chacham Tzvi. This is a very famous picture that until it closed down, was on display in the, I'm going to get this right, um, hang on, let me just try to find this. Um, yes, it was in the Jewish Museum in London, which I understand is now closed. But um, this is a picture of the Chacham Tzvi. Now, this is actually brought down, in the, this story is brought down in the commentary to the Shulchan Aruch. How the Chacham Tzvi was a, a tremendously great Ashkenazi rabbi. Um, actually, one of the, as far as I know, is the only Ashkenazi rabbi to go under the title of Chacham, which is typically used for Sephardic rabbis. Very interesting there. But he was based in Amsterdam, and they implored him on a visit to London for him to be for him to sit for a portrait to be drawn of him. Now he point blank refused. He absolutely refused to have his portrait taken. For the concern that we've expressed in the Gemara, you're not allowed to have a depiction of a human being. Now, although this is not, well, there is a discussion about whether painting constitutes three dimensions, because although it's not three dimensional in the typical sense, it does sort of emerge from the page in a three dimensional sense, what the Gemara refers to as boiletes. It does stick out. It's a bit of a dispute as to whether painting counts as a a three-dimensional image, but the, the bottom line is the Chachansi was not going to sit for this picture. Somebody with an incredible memory decided that he was going to paint the picture of the Chachansi anyway, and from memory painted this picture. And his son testified that the likeness was was so brilliant that it might have been done with Ruach HaKodesh, like divine powers. So it was such a good replica of uh, his father. The father was absolutely point blank not having it. He was not going to sit. The Chachansi was not going to sit for a portrait based on this hang-up that he had, according to the Gemara, you're not allowed to make human images. And the Ramban that says, even if they're two-dimensional, this is a big problem. As far as I understand, there are people that will not have pictures of their family in their home, maybe for this reason as well, which is very interesting because a photograph it really doesn't stick out. Rabbi Vajra Yosef, who is a great Sephardi rabbi, he's like, photographs definitely don't constitute an issue of three-dimensional images because they're completely smooth. But if you're going to be machmir for the Ramban, and the, the Ramban who says even two-dimensional images are a problem, maybe you would you would say that having pictures even two-dimensional in your home would be a problem. What you're going to find when it comes to this topic is that whatever you want to do, you will find an opinion that backs you up. So if you want to go around smashing around your pictures in your family's house, you can do that. If you want to keep them up, you can do that. But it's very, very interesting. And I'm still, uh, have, I've, we have yet to address this issue of the lions at my daughter's friend's cousin's neighbor's house. But as it stands, the Rambam, he paskins not like the Rambam. The Rambam has an issue with two-dimensional images. The Rambam, Maimonides, says two-dimensional is definitely not a problem. Only three-dimensional is going to be a problem. The Shulchan Aruch, which, by the way, was printed after this bird Haggadah. So this bird Haggadah predates the Shulchan Aruch. So, the Shulchan, so they wouldn't have had the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch takes on the opinion of the Rambam, mm -hmm. only three-dimensional issue, only three-dimensional um, um, models are going to be an issue. Who knows who the person at the bottom left-hand corner is? Not a Rambam. <laughs> I'll give you that. Well, this person is a lady called Ruth Handler, and she was the inventor of the Barbie. Mm -hmm. Now, she's <laughs> Jewish. She's <laughs> Jewish, making probably to date billions of three-dimensional human forms. Billions of dollars, maybe ahead of there, I think. <laughs> but the question is, is, is she allowed to do this? Is she allowed to make three-dimensional images or three-dimensional models of a Barbie? This is like, this is, I mean, you said two-dimensional images, you could be machmir for the own band. But the Shulchan Aruch says three-dimensional image, three-dimensional things of a person are a problem. So how can you make, or maybe to make it more extreme, how can we own Barbies? How can this be? 
the frumest among us actually might know what this doll on the top right is. So if we know what this is a, actually a very iconic doll on the top right here. So if we know who produces this doll. So this is a very famous doll produced by the Amish. The Amish have such a doll famously without any features at all because they want to avoid any sort of um, priority or focus on looks and fashion and trends. But at the same time, they want to foster a nurturing spirit in their children. So they come to this compromise of a faceless, featureless doll. Now, this may be actually halakhi because it doesn't look humanoid, as it were. But Barbie may be an issue. In fact, we've got Barbie. We've also got Lego as well. All these Lego men walking around. So we all started off assuming we, we don't. We, we would never do such a thing. Um, well, the, the news breaks that, that we may well. Now, I've heard a, a heta for Lego men. There's a heta for Lego men that... <laughs> that they don't look human, like they don't look like realistic. And I, I wondered, because when it comes to Barbie, that they did a study actually about um, whether Barbie dolls are actually realistic as far as human dimensions. And it turns out that if Barbie were to be a human being, um, her neck would be proportionally, it would be two inches thinner and, I'm sorry, two inches thinner and double as long as a normal human head neck ratio. So Barbie actually can't lift up her head if she was a physical human. So the head would be like Now, furthermore, her waist is so narrow, it would only have space for about half a liver and a few space, a few inches of intestine. Furthermore, her ankles and wrists are so narrow that she wouldn't be able to support her body weight. So what you have is a, 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 a creature with no internal organs that can't stand or hold up their head. So you have this groaning, dying beast crawling around. So maybe Barbie is not that human realistic anyway. I don't really know. So these are all definitely things to consider. Um, but I think probably the most reliable or the opinion that will give us the most room to move forward with Barbie dolls and Lego dolls is a question that was posed to the to in a safer called the Oz Nidbrook. Actually, about mannequins in shops. There was we have mannequins in shops designed to model clothing. These are really three-dimensional, proper. Sometimes they look very realistic. And somebody said, "Is a Jewish person allowed to have mannequins in their shops?" Now the Chacham Zodom, sorry, the, the Oz Nidru says there's two reasons why. Firstly, you remember the Gemara says if it's in public, it's okay. So he said these um, mannequins are for public display and for public use. There's no concern that somebody is taking them home and secretly worshiping. Secondly, he says. There is no way that these mannequins, but and I'm including Barbie dolls and Lego men in this, are treated with any sort of respect or any sort of deification. The, the, the torture that Barbie dolls were subject to in my childhood, <laughs> and that it seems to be continuing on to my children's childhood, is, is horrific. So these are not treated with reverence. These are not treated with any great degree of respect. And he says, based on this, there's room to say that all three dimensional images that we have today pretty much are going to be okay, and there's no concern of owning them. He says, if you want to be machmed, if you want to be really from, you can chip off a finger, or you can def deface them in some way. But just to go back to the case of animal statues, um, just the, the Shulchan Aruch says that all animals are okay. He says, Surah Sabah Hainus Chais, depictions or statues of um, animals, birds, and fish, trees and bushes and all these things they're absolutely fine there's no issue with that fascinatingly the bach the bach who was the first belzer rebel he was the first rabbi in bells he felt there was an issue with lions he had a particular issue with lions even though the shulchan Aruch writes that birds fish bushes, bushes animals are all okay he had an issue with lions reason being that lions are an astrological symbol they have the, the Zodiac, which has all sorts of things. And he felt that lions were actually not, a, that when you have a picture of a lion, it's not a picture of a lion, it's a picture of this astrological symbol. And there may be a concern that somebody would worship this lion as an astrological symbol. It's funny, he doesn't seem to mention this about any other animal or icon of the Zodiac. It seems to be that he's got a particular hang up with lions. And the Shach, 
references and says, I know the Bach says he has an issue with lions, but his 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 his, his, um, his wording is Loi Shamanu Mishan is our reserve. We have never heard, says the Shah of the commentary, anybody being mukpid, any being careful to avoid lions, and therefore he says it's absolutely okay. So this statue outside my daughter's friend's cousin's neighbor's house is actually okay as long as you're not a student of the Bach. Very important. I just found this out this this Shabbos. I was speaking to somebody about this, and they said that there was an incident where the Bach was um, asked basically to leave his community in Bells. It didn't end well, the Bach's relationship with the city of Bells. But as a gesture of respect to the Bach, the Bells of Hasidim to this day will have no icons of lions anywhere, not in their shuls. And we have a lot on our Sifri Torah. It's very famous to have the picture of the lions. In Bells, they have no lions anywhere. And that is out of respect to the Bach, who was one of the first rabbis of Bells. So I can tell you for free that these, my daughter's friends, cousins, neighbors, are not Bells of Hasidim. <laughs> Although they do happen to be placed directly opposite the Hasidish school. So if there's any zealots coming to school one day who feel that they need to stand up for the Bach, that, that would be um, probably something that they may take aim at. So bottom line, can you have statues in your uh, garden gnomes, um, owls, or any of these ornamental statues in your home? They are absolutely fine for a number of reasons. Firstly, um, we don't treat them with any, de any degree of respect. Secondly, any animals and birds and fishes are okay anyway. If you, there are those, however, who, when it comes to things like shaitel heads or any sort of image in the house, will take or make an effort to sort of take off a bit. Or uh, my brother Yishai saw his wife vociferously gouging out the nose of her shaitel <laughs> head. She felt that this was something that she wanted to do particularly on, and it's very commendable. Um, and there are those who are much even on pictures. So there really is a sliding scale. But I would say there is no need to go around to your house or anybody else's house smashing up their statues, although I know there are those who have the custom too. So these are just a couple of things. And I think maybe a takeaway message that we can have from this, the reason why um, the statues of people are treated in this vein, and the reason why the, the halacha in the first instance is so careful not to have images of people around is because we are made with Telemelikim. People are made in the image of Hashem. Secondly, also we have um, Hashem appearing to prophets and in the image of a person, as we famously reference in Anam Zemiris. Zikna Biyomdin, Hashem was an elderly person on the Day of Judgment, and he was a younger man when it came to the Day of Battle. So Hashem is made us in his image and also presents as a person. And I think there's the, the reason why there was a concern that people would worship statues of people as a god is because the similarities that people have and the representation that we embody of Hashem. And it's a, a time to treat your, the, the, the garden known with that bit more respect and definitely to treat each other with respect. And wherever we are, whoever we are, whatever religion that we may maintain or adopt, because we are all made in the image of Hashem and there is a godliness to everybody around us. So um, just a fascinating look. Keep your Barbie dolls, it's absolutely okay. Oh yes, so we, do we have time for this, the next page? Okay, fine. Right. So I thought, I thought we were running down on time. But very interestingly, so um, just to go through, um, on the very back page, there is, um, a, this is a very interesting, the top middle there, it's the, the famous depiction of the menorah being taken away from the base of Akash. There are those who say that this is actually okay in that it's not, it's not a three-dimensional picture. So that would, oh, sorry, it's not the complete image of a person. It's only got half, the half is sticking out. So there are those who say that's okay. This statue, I, I hope you will recognize this bottom on the bottom, bottom right, right? We all know that is Herzl. Yeah. So this is Herzl. And there is a theory that the reason why it was made in this two-dimensional form is, again, because they didn't want to make a three-dimensional image. I find that extremely hard to believe. I think it's just an artistic shtick. And it's a very nice one at that. Um, but there is also the added benefit that is not the complete image of him. So there are those who say things like a bust where you just have the salt shoulders in the head that would be okay the only real issue starts to be when you have a full-blown three-dimensional you know whole image of a person that would start to be an issue so the Herzl picture and the Monero picture both have um uh, mitigating factors as to why they may not be considered by Zara um but these two the the two on the, the left hand side there those always gave me a little bit of an interesting game. that little cat do you think that's an idolatrous statue to own. This is this is something that I was quite interested in. Any thoughts on the rise? So I says I just came back from, from the Orient. So I just came back from uh, the Far East. I bought one of these for you. 
Would you like it? Would, yeah. would, would you take such a thing? You have one. Well, ha, <laughs> let me tell you. No, so I looked into this. It's very interesting. This, although it seems to have a lot of re religious semantics, mm -hmm. is not particularly religious at all. This cat is called the Maneki Neko and is an ancient, it, it, it comes from this ancient Japanese story. There's a couple of variants of what exactly this cat did, but all the stories share in common. It was a cat who beckoned somebody in to a temple. Now, what happened at that temple? Either they avoided murderous armies or they avoided even something as minor as a big thunderstorm. For whatever reason, this beckoning cat that beckoned these people into the temple was seen as a symbol of good fortune, either because it avoided the army or because it avoided the rain. So I, I don't think it's actually got more to it than that. I think it's literally just become a symbol of good fortune. I don't think anyone treats this with any sort of idolatrous um, attachment whatsoever. What's more complex uh, is, well, there may be the superstitious element of it. That's an interesting one. If you really subscribe to this as a superstitious uh, icon, well, Jews are, in the Torah, are warned away from superstition. Again, I don't know how much, how superstitious it actually is. I don't think people actually treat this as a genuine bringer of good luck. I think it's just seen as a cultural icon. So I don't know, speak to a senior rabbi, but uh, I don't, I don't think... I think you have to be, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily think there's a massive issue in that. But the, the statue of Buddha, that's a real issue. Firstly, because it's a three-dimensional picture of a full-blown person. But it's not the way, we, that, that is not treated the way my kids treat their Barbie dolls and Lego men. This is something that's treated with genuine reverence, genuinely worshipped as an idol. So if you had this in your home, that would be the only thing that would, would give me cause for concern. And if, if you had a waving cat in the window... I don't know. I think it's just a cute little shit yeah, at this yeah. point. Um, so uh, a quick whip round um, ornamental um, Jewish iconicism. Um, it's all there. So you can have a, a prohibition from two dimensional people all the way to, to statues actually being absolutely OK, because we don't treat them as idols or with any sort of respect today. Um, so I'd say it's really up to you. You can do what you'd like. Um, some uh, just to wrap up, somebody once said, and this is, again, going back to the two dimensional extreme, if your Barbie doll breaks, and you fix it, you have then made an idol. So once the head comes off, kids, sorry, it's gone. It's never going back on. As the Torah says, you shall not make idols. But that's assuming that you treat a Barbie doll as an actual issue. I think you have a Chochmah Sodom who says, we're not treating it with any respect. There's no concern that somebody's worshipping their Barbies, and um, it should be absolutely a bar. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Pleasure to be back. Yeah, thank you so much. That was uh, really good. Um, I will uh, say goodbye to those on Zoom, and uh, we'll see you next week. Oh, we've got a question. Sorry, there's a question. Maybe. Maybe. The people that rally against the idea that it was anti-Semitic, they say it's so unlikely that Jews would have a Shagoda with just tons of anti-Semitism all over it. Firstly, because why they print such a thing or want such a thing. Secondly, you'd find a publisher that's willing to print a typical Haggadah as long as he can put anti-Semitic stuff in it. He's clearly not that much of an anti-Semite. He wouldn't print it in the first place. So maybe, maybe, but it's called the Birdhead Haggadah and it seems to be beaks, not noses. So, but yeah, it, there's no real certainty around it. Uh, on the front, we've got um, lots of pictures of um, pictures of things in the shul. Well, it's, it's, through, it's through the remains of it. And, um, I think it's in, in Syria. I think it's called Dinos Europos or something oh, like that. Oh, interesting. And this is about the about third or fourth century. Wow, because there's a separate issue of having pictures of people in shul. Well, and it's, not, it's maybe an extension of the same issue. That's really interesting. So it's it's a Syrian shul. I, I think it's I think it's in Syria. It's, it's something like Dinos Europos, something like that. That's so interesting. Um, uh, I, I can't remember the exact that type of stuff. Yeah, it could it's, be if it's a Syrian shul, they go with the one like to the exclusion of all else. About third or fourth century. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's before it's the Roman. Well, well before the Roman. Really, that's really interesting. Have to look at that. Really, really. Interesting.
I'm going to zoom off now. I'll just do the um, Rocha Corona and uh, thanks for everyone.